great job of uh, keeping the, the speaker busy with questions. So let, let me uh, encourage you to, to keep that up. Um, our next speaker is Alvaro Sanchez from Yale, who will tell us about directed evolution of microbial communities. So please, Alvaro. Hey, thank you, David, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about a, a, the, an area of research that's uh, one of the newer uh, fields of inquiry in my lab. And this is the first time I talk about this. So um, I, was, I was also thinking of that I, I'm gonna be getting, speaking to a physics audience where it's, uh, so I am expecting to be interrupted as I go. Uh, so please do, um, do go. And you know, ho hopefully it's often difficult to calibrate the length of these, these talks when, when that happens. Um, but I think it's okay if, if the, I, I, I try to design the talk in such a way that the more accessible part is at the beginning and then the latest half, quarter of the talk is a bit more detailed um, about biophysical mechanisms and so. So if, if we don't get to that point, that's fine. Um, all right, so the, the, let's just make sure this works. The, 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 what my lab works on is, is on, on the assembly and the evolution of microbial communities. And the main reason why we work on this problem is because microorganisms are everywhere. They're of course the most ancient organisms on earth. They were here way before plants and animals um, were on the planet. And you can find them essentially everywhere. They've colonized all of the large bodies of water and, and, and also like oceans and, and rivers and lakes. Um, they, you find them in large numbers in the soils. And they also have colonized the bodies of animals and plants, including the human body. Um, and they also are present in, in everywhere we inhabit. We, we find them in the cities where we live and in the foods we eat and absolutely everywhere else. And in all of these habitats, although they're very small, microorganisms play very critical roles. Um, the, they are responsible for the vast majority of nitrogen fixation. Uh, and I, the, I can keep quoting this number, I hope it's precise, but I think it is that, that soil bacteria alone are responsible for about 10%, a little bit less, but close to 10% of all carbon cycling um, in the atmosphere every year. So uh, that's when they occur in, in a free living state, but when they are associated with uh, plants and animals, they are have direct causative effects on health and disease. And um, we have also been using them in, the humans have been using them in, for biotechnological purposes for millennia. The, we all, primarily has been uh, throughout history for food production, for the production of wine and beer and other fermented uh, drinks and, and foods like you know, teas and, and, and bread and, and many others. And more recently, we've been using them for other applications such as um, the, um, the, the cleaning up water and wastewater treatment plants in biorefineries for the production of biofuels and uh, in, in the pharmaceutical industry and, and so on. The way that microorganisms have been worked with primarily throughout history has been by isolating them from the natural habitat and growing them under well-controlled conditions in the lab, uh, growing them in petri dishes like this from colonies, um, or in flasks where they are grown in monoculture, uh, or under the microscope where they also typically are forming uh, little colonies or single cells, um, all of genetically very um, homogeneous um, populations. But in, in nature, and as well as in industry, and, 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 and whenever we find microorganisms, most often they don't find, we don't find them living solitary lives, uh, most typically we would find them forming complex communities composed of large number of species which uh, interact with one another in, uh, in very interesting and fascinating ways. And the, those interactions are what give rise to, to many of the collective properties of these communities, right? And it is really, when we think of all the things and all of the services and functions that microbes provide, uh, they are the, the collective property of a large number of individuals Whose, whose actions are responsible for what we're seeing, right? So the composition of these communities is actually quite critical for all of these services they provide. And for that reason, understanding and controlling how communities form, how they evolve, uh, and how the function of micro communities uh, emerges from the function, from the composition they have, uh, is a real major goal in modern biology. So, um, that also 
brings the question of how can we possibly manipulate or engineer these communities um, so that they will fulfill functions that are that serve our purposes better, right? Uh, and and also to steer them away from from um, taking on functions that are detrimental for us, right? And essentially, there are two ways in which one can accomplish this of uh, manipulating or engineering communities. One is what we would call bottom-up engineering. And uh, to that end, you know, synthetic biologists have been putting together all kinds of uh, tools to, uh, to create communities from scratch by, by engineering organisms and, and engineering how organisms interact with one another and, and, um, and figure out ways to control that uh, from externally. Um, and also so that those communities will carry out functions that are desirable. Um, there's also been a, a set of, of new technologies that are being developed um, very recently to manipulate uh, the, the genetic makeup and also the species composition of microbiomes in situ where they occur. Again, with the purpose of potentially um, manipulating their function. That, that's an, in the end what we, what we want. Now, one caveat of all of these approaches, I mean, I think synthetic biology as a whole that it has the, the problem, uh, if you want to call it that, that, um, that it has to reckon with ecology and evolution, right? Um, even any synthetic biology, even when you're not engineering communities, even if you're engineering um, organisms or, or, or any kind of biological system below the organismal level, once you deploy it into a population, um, evolution will do its job, right? And, uh, and it, it, can it can easily change um, the, the designs that you're making. But when you are engineering communities, then ecology can also be an, another, another issue, right? Because you might be designing a community that will have a specific set of species, but if that community is open and can um, be invaded by other taxa, then it is very easy for, for the eco ecosystem to go in a different direction from what you would have imagined um, at first. So uh, there's another approach that one can use to engineer micro communities, which rather than, um, than, than trying to figure out how one can uh, fight ecology and evolution or, in, or introduce ecology and evolution to the design of synthetic uh, ecosystems so that, um, that it'll, it'll be robust, robust to them. Uh, the approach is to uh, use and leverage ecology and evolution to engineer microbial communities from the top down. And um, the, uh, the idea is actually not new. And, and if you think about it, uh, that is how humans have engineered uh, most organisms um, in, that we have domesticated, right? We have uh, created crops and, and, and farm animals. Uh, and so crops are typically used for food. Farm animals, we have used them for, for food as well as for making clothes and, and, and for, to power um, as, as, as a motive force, right? Uh, as we also have our engineered organisms to, to make you know, microorganisms like yeasts to, to make um, alcoholic beverages. And we have done all of this even way before we had a good understanding of the biological mechanisms and particularly the genetic mechanisms that, that connect the, the, the genotype with the phenotypes of those organisms that we were trying to evolve, uh, to engineer. And, and that is something we have done through a process that we're all very familiar with, which is um, selective breeding. That's how, for instance, uh, the indigenous peoples of the Americas uh, created corn from uh, basically um, very low nutrient content grasses. And the approach is something we, I think we're all familiar with. Um, you don't need to know exactly how the, the, the phenotype is encoded in the genotype, but what you can do is you could exploit natural, natural variation that already exists in the wild population. Um, and then what you do is you, you take uh, seeds, you, you interfere with the reproductive cycle of the, of, of the organism you, you are trying to breed. Uh, in nature, that breeding is going to occur through their own uh, natural processes, but in, in selective breeding, you can choose which organisms are going to be uh, chosen to pass the genes to the next generation. So you could take seeds from those natural variants that um, are, more, are closer to the traits that you desire, and, and then you can um, then create a new generation only from those seeds um, and then you can 
uh, recover your, your if you can, a new generation and then repeat the process multiple times. And as you keep selecting for reproduction only those organisms that are, um, whose traits are more discernible, over time you see an, an improvement uh, in the traits um, under selection. Now, um, this has worked at the organism level because we can manipulate the reproductive cycle of those organisms. But if we think of how we can apply them to communities or of, of microorganisms, the problem is that those communities do not actually have a, a reproductive cycle, right? Uh, they don't reproduce naturally as a, as a whole, right? So if we cannot interfere with the reproductive cycle, how could we potentially breed communities, right? How can we apply the same principles? Um, uh, well, actually, uh, people have, uh, you know, for now a few decades, been able to, to breed uh, biological systems who, which do not have a, an autonomous reproductive cycle. Uh, genes, proteins, and genetic networks have been engineered uh, from the top down through a process known as directed evolution, which has allowed us to, um, to, to actually create um, either proteins, RNAs, uh, or even circuits and metabolic networks with new or enhanced functionalities. The process of uh, of direct evolution is actually uh, remarkably elegant and simple. Uh, one starts from a gene that is uh, like a parent gene or uh, that will code say for a, a protein or an enzyme that we uh, want to optimize or, or improve uh, in, in whatever function we want. And the first thing you need to do is you, you need to create a library of genetic variants of that parental gene, right? That means that you're going to make a bunch of uh, some decent sized number of copies of that gene that contain mutations um, that are changed, that are similar to this parental gene, but, but not quite, right? We'll introduce mutations. Um, and then when the next step is then you express that, that library. Uh, you, you now uh, let them make the proteins that they code for. Um, and now you, you express the function of that protein, you do a screen, and those uh, variants whose function is not uh, improving in the direction you desire, you discard them. But those variants whose function improves um, with respect to what you had in the parent gene, in the parent gene you select, right? And then once you select them, then you now subject them to another round of mutations and create another library, which then you can express, select, and so on and so forth. So th th this process can be continued as many times as you want. Um, and the outcome has been uh, really nothing short revolutionary, right? People have used uh, direct evolution to evolve uh, new genetic circuits, to um, expand our, our repertoire of fluorescent reporters for applications in, in imaging. Uh, they've used them to generate enzymes that catalyze new reactions, to optimize drug manufacturing, in industry and, and so on and so forth. And so this, this is a very, very powerful technique. Uh, now, directed evolution uh, by and large has been applied to biological systems that are at or below the organismal level. So again, these are, these are systems that do not have their own um, reproductive, autonomous reproductive cycle. Um, and we need to make copies in, in the lab ourselves because the, the, organism, the, the, the systems themselves cannot uh, produce variants uh, on their own. But the question is whether the same approach or similar approach could be used to biological systems that are above the organismal level like a microbial community. And here the challenge is that a microbial community is, com is, is composed of organisms, right? And those organisms can indeed have their own reproductive cycles, right? Uh, but you do not want to necessarily interfere with those. What you want is to generate a collective that is, has a, a function that is better than the one you had before. So um, the question is whether or not this could be done, right? And, and in principle, the, the, the short answer is that technically speaking, you could really apply uh, artificial selection to any biological system at any level of organization, as long as um, three simple rules apply. Uh, first of all, you must be able to make copies of your evolving unit. So you must have a unit of reproduction. In this case, it could be, for instance, a microbial community. And you must be able to make copies of that microbial community. Um, the second rule is that there's, you must have variation um, along the trade of interest, right? Uh, in, in, the, in the parent generation. So you need to have some variation that you're selecting uh, that makes that some of those units have a more desirable trait than others, right? So that needs to happen. 
And finally, it's gotta be true that the variation that you observe in the parent generation, when you, um, you make copies of, of the various units, uh, that variation is also passed um, to the offspring, right? So individual units that have, a say, a high function uh, are going to have, uh, or, or a high trait that you're selecting for, are gonna have um, uh, offsprings, right, that you, that you create, which are more similar to, to the parent than, than they would be to any other random individual you may have chosen for reproduction, right? Um, that's what you know, evolutionary biologists call heritability, right? You, the, the traits must be heritable. So um, as long as you can do this, right, you should be able to apply a trivial section to anything, to communities, to organisms, below the organismal level, and so on, right? There, there isn't nothing preventing you from doing it, um, uh, at least in theory. So um, the question is, how have people tackled this challenge uh, of breeding microbial communities? The, 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 er, the earliest work, uh, uh, at least on the, on the microbial communities front, uh, was done by uh, Davidson Wilson and uh, William Swanson, Roberta Elias uh, from SUNY Binghamton uh, around 21 years ago. And uh, the, the very first thing they tried to do was to ask if they could possibly uh, apply artificial selection to, um, to breed a microbiome that will enhance plant growth. Right? And uh, this, this was done at a time when actually we didn't have the genetic sequencing tools we have now so that you can sequence the microbiome. Um, and, and for that reason, uh, the, the paper you know, had some limitations, but, uh, but, um, but they were still able to look at the, the effect that uh, doing microbiome breeding would have on, on the plant. And that's what they were trying to go after. Right, so their, their experiment is, is quite simple and, and elegant. They first started a population of plant uh, pots. Um, each of those pots were seeded uh, were, uh, from microbes um, that were sampled from the same species pool. Um, but the, the hope there is that they would start communities that would have uh, somewhat different initial com uh, species compositions, right? So they, you, they would start from, and I can't remember quite the number of pots they had, but they had a bunch of different uh, pots and each of them um, would have presumably a different microbial community on them. And then in all those pots, they planted seeds that came from the same um, stock of seeds, right? So the, the seeds they were planting in all these pots were uh, an inbred population of Arabidopsis. Um, so there should be very little genetic variation in the seeds that were allocated to each pot. And much the, the, but the variation, however, should be coming um, ideally from the communities that were, um, that were planted to on, on each of the pots. Now, the, um, the, 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 the seeds were allowed to germinate and grow for 30 days. And, and after 30 days, they would, um, they would weigh the, the plants that were seen on each one of these, uh, these pots. And then um, they would select for, they would take the, 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 the pots where the highest biomass was measured. And then at that point, what they would do is they would take the soil from those pots, they would mix and homogenize it. Um, and then they would spread over, uh, they would use that as, they, as a new inoculum uh, to, to see the new generation of pots, right? Where they would put, um, they would sample from this mixed and homogenized soil from the, from the selected community, from the selected pots. Um, and then they would um, sample and add uh, to different uh, new generation of pots. Um, through that process, they were hoping that they would generate uh, variation in the, in, in, the, in the pots they had. And then they would now seed all pots from the same genetic stock again, right? They would do exactly the same thing as it, they did before. Um, they would now, uh, the, the seeds were allowed to germinate again and grow for 30 days. And now after that, then you ha now have an offspring generation, right? So um, in that experiment, they have a parental generation, which they, they collected by seeding pots from, uh, from the same genetic stock and then uh, putting, inoculating each of the pots from, from the same uh, soil sluts that they had uh, found in a soil near their, their campus. Um, and then um, through the, this process I described, they can get an offspring generation of communities and, and that of offspring generation of communities will also give rise to plants um, that, that will have a different biomass, right? So what they can do then is that they can compare uh, the average biomass in the parental generation, as well as in the offspring generation, which was made uh, again from microbes that were chosen from the two, uh, or sorry, not the two, but whatever, the number of plants they selected that had the largest uh, biomass. 
So the question you would ask, well, did this work, right? If you keep selecting for the microbiome in the pods, are you gonna see a, an increase in the function of the plants? Um, well, I mean, uh, the, the results were not, I, I would say, extremely um, uh, convincing, but, but th there was at least some sign that the, the process might be working, right? And here's a comparison of two different replicate experiments they did. There's a somewhat different uh, initial, uh, the, the, the amount of, of soil they used in the inoculum was a bit different. I, I don't, I'm not com entirely convinced that actually mattered, but you know, whatever. Um, you can think of this as two different replicates, right? Um, and what you see here, two different lines. Um, this line, which had an open triangle, and which you probably cannot see very well, but um, this line over here uh, was um, a, a metapopulation that was established, and then they applied selection for the pods that gave rise to the largest plant biomass. And then in the upside down field uh, triangles, they're showing the, the same experiment, but they, that time, we're uh, selecting on low biomass, right? So we're selecting for those communities that will give you the lowest biomass. Um, in, in, in both cases, I mean, in this case, you see that, that the experiment seems to, the, the high biomass experiment um, gave a larger plant bi biomass than, than the lowest one. Here on the x-axis, I'm plotting the, the number of selection rounds they tried, and on the y-axis, I'm plotting, uh, they're plotting the, the, the weight of the plant, right? The phenotype they're selecting for. So there's clearly a relative difference, right? Uh, but it's it's much less clear in, in this one experiment, not so much here, and this other replicate. Um, but actually, the, the the actual the actual biomass of the plant didn't change over 16 generations, right? But after 16 generations, you had around the same biomass you had at the beginning of the experiment, right? Uh, and that's true in both experiments. So um, it really did, that didn't seem like the experiment is working super well. But at least they do seem to see. Um, a differential uh, response to both treatments in one of the lines, right? So that's, that's the experiment they did. I think it's a very provocative idea, um, though clearly it required follow-up work. And that follow-up work, follow work happened, but not too much, right? Uh, there's been a bit of a handful of papers published um, that have attempted to do this experimentally, right? Which is kind of surprising given that it's such a cool idea, um, and, but there's really not been a lot of work following up on this. Um, some actually is, is work from my own lab that I'll have a chance to tell you a little bit later. And um, in like by and large, uh, yes. I have, uh, I have a question about the data that you were showing uh, a couple of slides ago. Yeah, here. Um, so I understand the point that by the end of 16 generations, there doesn't seem to have been a relative increase in the dry rate, but uh, in both rounds, there seems to be some sort of uh, I don't know whether to call them oscillations, but there is uh, there's something systematic that seems to be going on to the dry weight. It sort of goes above this mean, below this mean. Did the mm. authors speculate uh, as to why that was happening? Because it seems like if you stopped this experiment, not at 16 generations, but let's say at 12 generations, yeah, uh, then you would see an increase in the overall biomass repeatably, right? Right, that's interesting, right? Because um, but the funny thing is, if, for instance, if you had stopped here, right, you would have seen that there's a, there's a, a relative in, increase, right, in the high biomass relative to the low biomass. But the plants selected for low biomass would still be have higher biomass than the ones you know they started with, right? So so if there is a relative increase. I mean, relative increases have been seen multiple times. I'll show you more data later, as well as data from my own lab. And, and I think that isn't. I I I, I believe that, that that they that that's something you can see, right? And we have to. I other people, uh, yeah, other people have reported that too. Yes. I see. And uh, do the authors speculate, or do you have some understanding of why uh, this dry weight goes up and then goes down and then goes up and then goes down? I don't think I don't think they did. But take into account that these are like thirty-day long experiments. Um, so basically, every incubation is about a month, right? Um, and I, I I don't really remember where they did the experiment, but I mean, like seasonal fluctuations might have been a role. I, I don't remember that they speculated why. I would have to mm -hmm. repeat the paper again. Um, but right, uh, yeah, I would also suspect that the environment was responsible because it yeah. seems to be the same rounds of selection in right. which the dips occur in both experiments. In both experiments, like, like right. 10, 10 seems to be the point where every every one dips. Uh, yeah, no yeah. there the clearly are correlations. And here in 15, in generation 15, I, I believe they said they had an algal bloom. Uh, so they had a contamination in their, uh, in their, in their pots that, that essentially made plants uh, very sick, right? 
So, so, so they're, 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 and you see they're, they're correlated in both, right? So, yeah. so I, and then here too. So, I mean, there are clear correlations and even in, in all, all lines, you know, they have their, their maximums and minimums around the same place. Um, I mean, it's not perfect, but I, I would say there's a very strong correlation for, for experiments. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised given the, the length of these experiments and that, you know, things like seasonality, environmental fluctuations of other kinds could have very likely um, affect, driven these fluctuations. Yes. Thank um, you. Yeah. So can I ask another question? It looks like in round 15 in the upper plot, the yes. rate goes to zero and right. then miraculous recovery. What's going on? I, I think that what they found here was, uh, if I remember correctly, that there was an algal invasion of the pots, um, which, uh, and I don't know if this was exactly zero or, or it was a very small um, plants germinated but didn't, weren't successful after that. I, I can't remember if it was exactly zero. But remember, they're not selecting on the plants, right? So, so they are selecting on the soil. Yes. Right? So, yes. so the plants are, even if you have zero one generation, uh, the next generation, you, you, things might recover, right? Because uh, the, as, as you uh, it re-inoculate plants, then all you need is that a few of them actually um, uh, are successful again, and then you will have a, a non-zero. They're putting here the average dry weight of the, of the, entire, um, of the entire line. Right. And they collected the seeds then, uh, and, 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 and that's how the next document, the, the plant, the next generation of plants, they just used the seeds from the previous one. No, 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 no. The, the seeds were constant, right? So the seeds, are, the, ah, seeds, are, yeah, the, seed, the seeds are not co-evolving. Very that's good. I see. So they could just, just plant some new seeds if it all died. Right, right, right. Exactly, exactly. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank right, you. right, right, right. That's exactly what they did. Absolutely. Yes. That's a very, very important point because um, the, it's, it's, they, they did this experiment and it's, it's a very elegant design, right? They were doing the experiment so that the microbiome was what they were changing, right? But not, not the host. The host is the same throughout, right? There's no co-evolution between them. To avoid any kind of interference between are you doing artificial selection of the host and this the indirect effects on the microbiome or, or, or so on and so forth, right? So that could have been a very interesting experiment as well, but, but they didn't do it that way. Thank you. All right. Um, all right, so this is the experiment. As I was saying, you know, a bunch of people have tried it, but not many, right? And, and which is uh, surprising in many ways, um, given that it's really a cool experiment. Um, and, and, but a few people have tried, um, and I, I was, uh, all of them have I followed from the, the, this, this pioneering work by Sloan Wilson and colleagues and used the same two strategies. In, in Sloan Wilson paper, they also had another, another experiment that I'm not reproducing here for lack of time where they were selecting for uh, communities that would lower the pH or increase the pH of, um, of a water solution, right? Um, and, and, and anyway, the, 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 the two strategies that people have followed um, also followed the ones used by Sloan Wilson and colleagues. One is the selection strategy called the mixed pool strategy, where you have a selected function and then you have, you rank your communities based on, the, based on it. And then you select the two communities that have the highest or the most desirable function. And then you pull them, right? You, you, you mix them and homogenize. And then you use that as a new inoculum from which you randomly sample into new habitats and generate a new generation of communities, right? The second method is called the propagio strategy. Um, and there, what you do is you take that you, that you again select the two, um, you know, the two communities with the highest function, and then each of them you just pass it without mixing, right? So you sample from this very high performing community uh, into multiple new habitats, right? Um, so by sampling from it, you might, you know, some species may go extinct, you might do a, a bottleneck that perturbs and maybe a system goes to another alternative stable state or what have you. That's the, the logic of doing it that way, right? Uh, but there's no mixing here, right? So you, you just have that. Um, these three will be uh, direct descendants of this one guy. These two communities will be direct descendants of this one guy. Okay. Um, now, in most of these cases that I that I am showing here, um, selection did not work much better than a random control. And when it did, uh, it, it most typically what it, what happened was that r relatively um, the selection line was um, did better than the random control. Uh, in relative terms, right? But both of them um, did not necessarily follow the, the, um, the desire increase in, in directional selection. Um, for instance, there's an example where the, the trade in the selection was the flowering time in plants. And the, these authors, Panky Busey et al., were selecting for um, a line of early flowering and late flowering plants 
Uh, this was all, they also did with Arabidopsis as well as Brassica rapa. And um, here they're, they're showing the days to flowering in a line that was selected for late flowering um, and another line that was selected from early flowering. And you could see that there's a difference between them. I, th I think this is probably the most successful experiment that I've, I've seen so far. Um, but even the, the early flowering um, line was uh, flowering later than what they started with, right? So there is relative in, in, uh, there's a relative difference between the two lines, that's for sure. Uh, but it doesn't look like you can very well control it the, in, in absolute terms how, um, how the, at, at least, I mean, maybe it worked for late flowering, but early flowering was clearly not as easy to, to modulate in this case, right? Um, uh, hi, Alvaro. I have another question. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so you explained the rationale behind the propagule strategy, and I think I agree with it and I understand it. What is the rationale for the mixed pool strategy? I'm confused, especially because, you know, if you're trying to select for a community, as one unit, then why would you want to, you know, do this weird mixture thing? Right. Um, I'm, I'm going to argue, and I'm going to I'm going to explain later. I, I think it's a terrible idea for <laughs> for microbes. Uh, these two these two um, these two uh, strategies were derived from uh, were borrowed from earlier work uh, on experimental group selection in animals. Uh, and and these were these, these early experiments were done by Michael Wade and Charlie Goodnight on on beetles on, on trivolume populations that were. Um, they established, this is a single species population, and in one case they did a two species population, but never mind that. Uh, what they were doing in, in those early papers, that they were mixing, making populations of, of beetles that were sexually reproducing, right? Um, and and they, they had very, very small populations with 16 individuals, right? Uh, and they even started the populations with a highly outbred um, genetic stock. So there was a lot of genetic variation to begin with. So if you mix that you have large genetic variation, sexual reproduction, um, animals and, and small populations, then actually the mixed pool strategy is not that crazy, right? Because you're gonna be sampling, uh, you're gonna be selecting communities and then you're gonna let them uh, interbreed between them. And that's just the, the process of, of sexual reproduction is gonna generate new genotypes that you didn't have that before. If you have asexually reproducing microbes that also I mean, microbes can exchange uh, genes by horse mating transfer, but uh, let, let's consider that a relatively uh, second order effect, right? Uh, recombination is rare in microbes compared to animals and populations are humongous, right? So by, by pooling them, all you're doing is you're taking variation that you had before and pretty much eliminating it. And, and if you actually take into account, I'll, I'll talk more about that later, but if when you pool, then you redistribute and, and when you redistribute microbes, microbes we're talking about at the very, very minimum and being very generous, you have no fewer than 10 to the six microbes, right? And typically given what their, their actual populations are, and at least 10 to the 10, right? So it, it's, that's a lot of what sells, right? So stochastic sampling, when you have such you know, gigantic numbers, um, is gonna be very, um, a very poor way to, to generate variation, right? Uh, because uh, unless you would, would they would they would have you would have to use very very strong bottlenecks. It is something that actually uh, microbiologists have known for a very long time, right? That that if you wanted to do enrichment ex uh, experiments, they have this this technique called dilution to extinction, which it precisely is based on the fact that when you do something like this, you need to apply a very very strong bottleneck if you want to see variation. I don't know if that answers your question, but but I I I I, I don't blame you for feeling that this is not a, a no, no, it does. Probably a very so a very productive strategy, right? It sounds yeah. Um, and do you know which of these two was more common in all of the different papers? That yes, uh, the, the mixed the mixed pool by far. That that this has been oh. tried as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually show you a few a few results in a minute. Um, so um, yes. Hi, uh, this is Sri Sri Ayer Biswas. Yes. Um, Non-expert question. Um, would you comment on how these uh these results or these trends depend on the imagination of the experimentalist in choosing an attribute to select for. Is there some sophistication in choosing attributes beyond, G? this is something we would like? Um, well, I mean, the, the, really, I mean, it, if, it depends on how you frame the question, right? Because you could be doing this kind of experiment to probe the limits of group level selection, for instance, right? So that which is the, the, the beetle experiments I mentioned be before, they were done in a context where evolutionary biologists were arguing whether or not um, selection could apply above the level of the organism, right? So those experiments were done to, to address a, a, a fundamental question, right, in evolutionary biology. 
um, and they were done with, with Beatles and they were, they were, the experiments were very cleverly designed so that um, they would fulfill all of the three rules that we could call them Lugontin's rules, if you will, um, for what, are, what is required for selection to act on. If what you are trying to do is to engineer communities uh, for a specific purpose, then, then that purpose constrains what is the function you can select for, right? Um, and, uh, and now, of course, now what functions you may want microbiomes to optimize are very much up to the imagination of whatever you want them to do, right? You, in my lab, we've, we've tried, uh, or we've, we're playing with the idea of using, um, trying to select for microbiomes to enhance the longevity of animals, for instance, right? Um, we are also now trying to, to I'll, I'll show you some experiments later that we're optimized at the moment, but we're trying to select for communities that will optimize um, the expression of enzymes that might be relevant for biotechnological purposes, but also will allow us to ask questions about uh, complex traits that, um, and, and, and complex interactions in communities, right? So that whatever the, the trait that you want to optimize depends on, on your purposes, right? So if you are trying to solve a specific technological problem, then that constrains it. And for this early work um, in, in, in Sloan Wilson's paper, the, I think that the coolness of the, of the paper was that he, uh, he and his colleagues, right? They, they, they took ideas from group level selection that were applied to a single population to an entire ecosystem, right? Because they were, trans they were transferring soil. And, and, and what that means is that, that the inoculum was not only a microbial community, but also the environment that the community is, is affecting, right? Through their growth. Uh, so that is was also being passed straight. So in, in that regard, they, they, the question is whether selection could apply to an entire ecosystem. And that's what, what they were trying to address, right? Um, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but, but I think that it, it really is a con very contextual depending uh, question, whatever it is you want to accomplish. Can I uh, ask a quick question to go back to what you said? You said that we neglect horizontal gene transfer, but can you just say uh, for the novice, what is, what is causing uh, genomic variation uh, in these systems? Can you right. right, 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 right. So that's a very good question. So when you do something like this, right, um, there, there's two, and I'm gonna talk more about that later, right? Um, but there's essentially two processes that are occurring here, right? One is you're growing a microbial community for 30 days, right, in a, in a new environment, in a pot, in a, in a greenhouse, right? So that microbes adapt, right? And, and there will for sure be mutations and, and very likely horizontal gene transfer occurring in those communities. That's, that's unquestioned, right? Um, so that will generate variation at the individual level. But now when you, um, you sample from a pool of species to generate a new community at the group level, right? If you do the same process many times, uh, the whole community will be different, right? So that will generate also variation uh, that's ecological in nature, right? But if you conceive the, the entire community, um, you think of the, of, the, of the weighted metagenome of those communities, um, that will also create variation in the genetic content of each community, right? So, if, so purely ecological processes, even if there was no evolution, right? And I'm yeah. gonna argue that today, you can create differences in the genotypic composition of each community, right? And, 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 and the genome content of each community. Yes, thanks a lot. That's a beautiful idea. Yes. Um, all right, so the, the first thing we wanted to do in, in, in our lab is, is to ask why these experiments were not more successful than they had been. And I'm, I'm gonna reiterate, read some of the things that, that I, I just said, right? Um, but one of the problems is that getting to the bottom of this is, is really challenging because the experiments are really hard. <laughs> I mean, they're simple, but they just take a lot of work to, to do them, right? Because you have to maintain multiple lines, right? So it's not just you need to keep a population of multiple organisms is that you need to take, keep many of them if you want to get statistics, right? Or if I want to perturb the systems in, in, in a specific way uh, or try different forms of selection, uh, every single time you do it, that's months of work. Um, and, and even just getting multiple replicate lines to do statistics is, is actually very difficult uh, logistically um, and, and very challenging. Uh, Alberto, can I ask another yes. question? Uh, perhaps connects to a previous question that was asked before, but uh, in all of these cases, the functions that were being measured, was it clear that the fact that it was a community played a role in those functions or could it really have been one very good microbe? No, they, 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 that's a very good point. Um, no, that's been a question that has been outstanding in the, in the field, right? To what degree, uh, it's been addressed now to some to, to different degrees, um, but experimentally it has not been, right? Um, and I'm, I'm gonna tell you more about it, hopefully at the end of this talk, 
if I have time about, about what we're, how we're kind of addressing that particular issue. But yes, I, I, that's a wonderful question. And it, it's one thing that needs to be addressed. I don't think it has. Um, at least I don't find that the explanations I've, I've seen very satisfactory. I've, we, there's been analysis of networks and things like that, but it's never been very clear to me that that, uh, that gave me a very mechanistic understanding of what was going on. All right, so um, to, to make headway into this question, right, and to, trying to understand why these experiments might not have worked so, as well as, as, as one might have, have hoped, um, we have been doing simulations, right? Because that, um, in some sense, right, we could start populations of in silico communities, right? And, and then apply artificial selection to those in silico communities and ask, will it work, right? If we apply the protocols that previous authors have proposed and used in their experimental systems, and we apply the same protocols to, um, in, to all of them to the same problem. So we can pose a problem that is computational in nature. We, we simulate um, uh, mi microbial communities using um, classical ecological models called uh, consumer resource models. We've done this um, um, in collaboration with uh, my, my friend Pankat Mehta and, and Bobby Marslan and, and Josh, uh, Josh Goldfer and, and, and all, all those folks in Boston University. Um, so you could, you could establish uh, computational models of micro communities, which are fairly abstract in many ways. These are with random uh, where species are modeled uh, having random uptake rates of various resources. And also they can secrete nutrients to the environment. They can uptake nutrients from the environment. And as they do so, they grow. Uh, don't mind the equations really. They don't matter for the purpose of this talk. Um, this is just to show if, if, this is, if you're familiar with them, that's, this is what we're doing. But if you're not, it really, it's, it's a non sequitur here, right? So we just have, um, we, can, we can establish uh, computational simulations of communities. Uh, and now what, what together with the folks in my lab we have been doing is we have been building upon the work that Pankatz and, and the group and his group has been doing to, to create a package that will uh, allow us to, um, to do artificial uh, selection or direct evolution of communities, right? Um, the, so using this as the, as the engine, what we can do is we can establish multiple different uh, communities. Um, once we establish them, we, we let them grow, let the cells grow, right? After they grow, we, we, um, we measure functions, and, I, and I'll tell you in a minute what we mean by that. Uh, but we can measure an attribute of those communities. Uh, for instance, um, you, can, you can measure the, the amount of, um, of a specific resource that they would consume, right? To mimic, for instance, if you were rearing a community to, to degrade a specific pollutant from the environment. Um, and once you rank those communities, then you can do the same thing as, as we've shown you before. You select those that have the highest function, and then you can apply a, a set of of different the protocols that I was describing before to create a new generation, right? So we basically are uh, reproducing in silico um, the, the, the experimental pipelines that other people have, the, the protocols for community level selection that other people had proposed, but we're applying those uh, protocols to the same uh, community and the same function. And we're repeating in many replicates, right? So that we can get statistics and try to really get to the bottom of if they work, why? And if they don't work, why, right? So, um, we have selected for multiple different community level functions. Uh, I I'm gonna focus on this one, the consumption of a specific supplied resource, um, uh, meaning biodegradation, but it really doesn't matter. I mean, the results I'm gonna show you are pretty generic um, and quite robust to actual function you select for, at least in our communities, right? I'm not trying to make a blank statement that this is always true. Uh, for the, the specific situation we have in our communities, we haven't seen a, a very big difference in any of the qualitative findings I'm about to report. Uh, when we try different functions, right? Um, again, this could be a specific artifact of the communities and and the and the specific uh, in silico pipeline we are using, right? Um, this is the outcome, right? So with this, we adapted all the protocols that have been published previously uh, to this problem. We, we what we do is we have our in silico communities. We give them a resource with the many resources, but one of those resources um, is like a toxin, so to speak. And we're asking, okay. Uh, can we select the community that will be best at breaking down this, at, at basically eliminating this toxin from the environment by, by metabolizing them and, and turning them into biomass, right? Uh, and we used all of, uh, all of these protocols. In, in purple, these are protocols using the propagule strategy. And in orange, these are protocols using mixed pool strategies, right? And they were all, the protocols were adapted to, to using the same number of uh, a population uh, size, uh, the same number of communities, which has 96 communities, um, taking into account that some of these protocols were applied to populations containing 16 communities or there's 32 communities. But just to make sure we are comparing apples and apples, we, we, we just 
adapted those to, so to deal with 100, right, or 96 in this case. Um, and then we ran the same protocols multiple times for various different um, uh, uh, randomizations of the species pools that we used, right, just to make sure that our results are statistically robust. Right? And what we find is that none of this, uh, and also here um, in previous work, uh, let me see actually see if I can show you, so what I'm plotting here, the community function, Typically, what, what it's plotted in the, in the, in the, the data I've, sh I've shown you before is actually the average community level function rather than the, the best community, right? We reason that when you are actually trying to solve a biotechnological problem, uh, what your goal is is not to increase the mean function of a population of communities, right? You want to generate as a community that is particularly good at whatever it is you're trying to wear for, right? So what I'm plotting here is that the maximum function in the, in the, in the offspring community uh, and comparing it with the maximum function in the parent, right? Uh, in, in the entire population of the parent um, that you start with. So you, we're just basically comparing real, really, I mean, you have an initial um, population of communities, each of which has a function. That is going to have, one of those communities is gonna have the highest function. Um, so now if you were to propagate those communities without any selection whatsoever, if you just kind of pass it all of the communities and every community give, gives rise to another community by simple propagation, um, that, that's a no selection control, uh, or versus when you do the, the actual selection experiment that, that using the protocols that they have uh, proposed. And what we show here is that, that you never, almost never, or very rarely do better uh, through the protocol that these people have suggested, the people, including ourselves, by the way, right? These two paper, <laughs> these two are protocols that my lab has, um, has used before. Um, so it, it actually never works, right? I mean, it, it, it just doesn't. Like you, you, you very rarely uh, improve the, through the propagial method or the, um, uh, or, or the mixed pool method, uh, you get a community that's better than, even, the, even if you have done nothing, right? Um, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you now why, right? Uh, why this is. And, and, and we, we, we try to get to the bottom of why is it that these protocols are so really not, not a very good idea, right? To, to work with. Um, there's, there's mainly two, two reasons. The first one, uh, is, Alfredo, can I ask a question about the method? Just uh, sorry if I missed something, but uh, when you're doing the selection, are you also generating variation from round to round? Like that is, is there is there any mutation or so on and so forth occurring? No, so so this, uh, I'll, I'll talk about evolution in a minute. This, these protocols, um, we uh, purposefully didn't put evolution in. And I we can have a discussion later about their relative meaning of evolution and ecology, right? When we're talking about asexual organisms, because I, I actually don't think it, there re, there's really a difference. Um, sure, sure, uh, no, I understand. So I guess in principle, and correct, correct me if I got this wrong, you will generate many, many sort of random communities, so to yes. speak, from the school. And uh, then you're just basically asking, which is the community that I generated, which is the best at this one function, which is, right. uh, I guess the function is to, uh, have the lowest concentration of this toxin or steady right. state. Absolutely. Um, and so in that case, now, I guess what I'm getting confused about is I, now I don't need to do multiple rounds of selection, right? I just need to basically generate, you know, thousands of, what, of these communities and just pick the best one. Right. And then, and then I found the best one and the best one by definition should be better than the average community that did this. Yes. Uh, so, so maybe nope. I'm having trouble. So here I am comparing. So if you, so imagine that you just kind of seed a hundred communities from a hundred different species pools, right? So you could take some stool matter, you could take some soil samples, you can take some aquatic communities, and from each of these, you inoculate a, a, a test tube, right? Uh, and then to all of the test tubes that now you have a hundred different communities, and to all of those test tubes, you add a pollutant that you want the community to to, to break down, right? Now you have a hundred different communities, and then what you could do is like you can grow your communities for say a week, right? Um, measure the amount of biodegradation you have on it, right? Uh, and then do nothing. You just take a, a small sample from each of the communities and you use them to make another community, right? Uh, so now you have a hundred communities. Each of, each of the communities in your parent pool gave rise to exactly one descendant, right? There's no selection at the community level, right? Um, there will be, of course, ecological interactions, selection, right? At the individual and the species level I within see. each one of the communities, right? That will still be happening. Uh, but you are, if you're not applying any kind of at selection at the group level, you, all you're doing is you're passaging every community every, say, every week, right? Um, and, and then um, after, you know, and then what you can ask is if I keep doing this for, for, I don't know, 20 times, right? I can say, okay, 
if I do nothing, right, I'm going to have a community that will be, uh, I measure the, the functions of my communities at the end of the 20 passages, and one of those communities will be better, will be the best, right? Um, and I, so that's, that's this one here. This is the, the Fmax for the non-selection control. Now, I am comparing this to what you would get if you applied these protocols, right, uh, to the communities. Um, I see. It, you know, in, in that, it, it, like just the protocol. And then, and then you ask, okay, if I do that, and I think the best community I have after 20 rounds of selection, um, what would it be better than, uh, what is the, the, the this, is, this is the number here, right? So if this number is positive, it means that the maximum function in your selection treatment um, is higher than the maximum function if you did nothing, right? And, and here, all of, as you can see, for all of the protocols, they're all either negative or around zero. That, that right, but this but this sort of this sort of seems like it's only happening because you're because nothing is changing from round to round that is to say that you know for instance there's no variation being generated from round to round so then maybe i'm not so surprised why why it doesn't work multiple rounds is not going to give you any better than just doing it once right so I, I'm, I'm going to show you some experimental results of what happens when when you do have mutations um no, you're right that we're not introducing any mutations here. All we're, we are, however, applying the protocols they did, right? So yeah. they are redistributing um, the microbes through ecological processes in the exact same manner, right? So the ecological means to generate variation are still applying, right? So if, if sorting species, um, the, so basically just sampling taxa, for instance, in the mixed pool, you're mixing the, the, the bacteria together and then using that to sample bacteria. There will be some stochasticity there, right? So you are introducing variation um, through ecological means every single time you pass it, right? That is still true. Right? So uh, the, the question is what we wanted to show here, right? Is that doing that alone um, is just not enough, right? And, and in fact, this is one of the, the, the problems that the exact problem you're having, right? So we, um, we noticed that there's two issues with this approach, right? In the absence of evolution, if evolution is not fast enough, right? Every, every single time you do selection, you are eliminating variation, right? So, um, in a nutshell, if, if you have some amount of variation in your parent population, and now you apply a mixed pool strategy to uh, just a single round right, of selection, um, these are you know, 100 different um, populations that we used. In all cases, uh, every single time you apply selection, you eliminate a lot of variation from the, from the population. And we were using um, dilution factors that were comparable to what people have used experimentally. Right? So our, our point here is that unless evolution is supplying this variation, right? Uh, ecology itself uh, through these two mechanisms is not capable of supplying the variation that you require for evolution to occur. So that's one of the problems, right? The propagative strategy is particularly terrible, right? At, at, at this, right? Because the communities are very, very similar, are basically clones to the parental communities, right? So the ec ecology alone is not able to generate variation. And that, that's, I think you're exactly right, right? For why this doesn't work. Um, now, the, the nice thing about this approach is that you can separate ecology and evolution, right? You, you can first say, okay, if we only have ecological, ecological means, right? Uh, do we, can, can this work, right? As a, as a form to regenerate the variation that we lose through selection. It is clear for everybody, right? For, for selection to occur, you need to have very phenotypic variation, right? But every time you select, you're truncating that variation. So unless you figure out a way to replenish that variation, um, the selection will just fail after just a couple of generations because you are gonna eliminate all variation you have and effectively, you're going to end up just selecting on, on non-heritable components to, to those traits, right? Uh, just any random noise, even experimental noise measuring the trait that you, you want to measure will uh, be something you'll be selecting on. But that's one problem. There's another one that is actually uh, as bad, if not worse, um, which is that uh, in all of these protocols people were using, they were selecting immediately, uh, immediately after inoculation from the environment. Now, the problem you have is that um, if, if you apply selection um, after just a single incubation period, you are going to be selecting on communities that are very, very far from equilibrium, right? And, wh and what that means is that here we're illustrating this, this point very simply. If you don't do any selection right, at all, if you just basically inoculate 100 communities from 100 different species pools, and you just pass them over time, uh, over time, those communities will, will reach a state of equilibrium. But the the community that had the highest function at the time in the, in the very first generation, when you start the selecting, is, is very rarely one of the communities that ends up having a good function or one of the optimal functions once communities have equilibrated, right? So if you are selecting for communities that are very far from equilibrium, uh, you are jumping the gun and selecting for, for communities that are 
It may ha have had a good high function early on, but it was an unstable function, right? Because of ecological dynamics, where species composition is changing. This at this point, you might have the community had a very high function because it had species that would eventually go extinct, right? Um, and, uh, and and therefore, as as the community now st stabilizes, its function might not be as high as it was before. And and these are this is precisely the I think the point you were making actually that that, that you you have two. The, the, these two, these ways of, uh, of doing selection, both the propagule method and the and the mixed pool method, are in in many ways uh, counteracting the two principles that you require for selection to occur. Again, assuming again, there's no evolution or simulations granted, right? So ecological processes alone, right, are just not sufficient to uh, to to generate the variation that you require, um, and also make because they are selecting before communities are in equilibrium. The variation is not heritable, right? Because the, the, the parental function will not be correlated with the offspring function once the community, the offspring community, it has time to equilibrate. Right? Um, if if you have not, communities in equilibrium are actually quite heritable, right? Because the, uh, you can if you pass these communities that are in equilibrium, at some point um, the, the 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 offspring community will be identical to the parent community, right? So that if you have multiple different communities, that variation will be very heritable. But if you're selecting on communities that are very far from equilibrium, um, then there will be very little heritability between parent community and offspring community, right? Uh, like like a uh, uh, the offspring of a parent that have higher than average function will not necessarily have a function that is higher than average, right? So these for these two reasons, right? The the approaches that the, these protocols do not work in the absence of uh, reintroduction of variation, and and and. And that is precisely the, the point that drove us next, right? Um, when we think of how people do directed evolution, right? The way they do this is, uh, as I described before, through a, a process of randomization and selection. And every time you do a, a, a run of selection, you need to randomize again, right? And through this approach, the, what you are doing is essentially climbing fitness landscapes, right? You, you start here, you generate a bunch of variants, then you select the variants that has higher function, you generate a, a bunch of variants, then select the ones that has higher function, generate another round of variants, select the one with highest function. And through this process, um, you end up climbing a genotype phenotype map, which you can think of as a, a, or a fitness landscape, right? That's how direct evolution of biomolecules work. But when you are dealing with communities, the, the main problem is that um, the, the, the genetic composition of communities is tied to the ecological, the abundances of the various species you have, right? So if you are, for instance, in a situation where you, you are in a community that is in equilibrium, um, then if you perturb it just uh, slightly, the community is gonna end up going back exactly the way it was, right? So not all communities that you make up uh, will be stable, right? If you start with a community in this, and here I'm plotting the abundance of species J, abundance of species Y, if you start a community here, over time, the community is going to move here, right? This community is gonna move there, that community is gonna move there, that community is gonna move there, and so on and so forth, right? So you can start with a communities that have variation originally, but if that variation is not stable over time, that variation is going to disappear, even if you do nothing, right? Just, this is gonna to converge to an equilibrium. So this is something that you don't need to worry about when you're um, when you're doing artificial selection or directed evolution with biomolecules. So the 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 approach that one should follow, rather than these propagule and mixed strategies, mixed pool strategies, um, as, as we see it, is, is is somewhat different. And inspired by direct evolution, what you would do, right, is you would start inoculating um, your a, a community, right, through by by you know starting at some point. Um, then let it reach equilibrium. And once it is in equilibrium, you can reintroduce variation, for instance, by re-inoculating with, with, um, with species from the original species pool, right? So if you now bring in, um, you have 100 communities, select the one that, is, that, that does best, the one in equilibrium. And now once you have this, the, uh, that community in equilibrium, you can generate variants uh, by bringing in new species from, from extraneous sources, right? So this is not an evolutionary process, it's an ecological one, but it will have the same, the same effect, right? You, you're gonna have a, a, a set of communities that now vary in the, gen, in the content, uh, the genetic makeup of the population. And you can do this simply through migration pro, pro processes, right? By bringing in species from various different regional, uh, regional pools. And therefore you generate a, a, a set of different communities that have different compositions and therefore different functions. Through that process, if you, uh, if you, if you perturb it that way, 
you might push communities to um, away from based of attraction, attraction uh, of that state you had. And then those communities will over time um, now equilibrate to another state, right? Uh, and once the communities are in equilibrium, you can perturb again. So what we're proposing is, is this cycle of seed, stabilize, rank, perturb, stabilize, rank, perturb. So it adds to the direct evolution uh, approach a step, which is stabilization, right? And also um, it can take advantage of the fact that you can actually uh, introduce variation through purely ecological means, right? Into your population. You don't need necessarily to evolve the species within for the community as a whole to, to change through evolutionary processes, right? So, so that's what we uh, were proposing that one could do differently from what has been done in the past, right? And I think it's very much in line with what you were proposing actually. Um, so what- uh, can, I, can I follow up to this? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this is interesting. So from what I understand, the, the reason that stuff wasn't working before was that at least in your model, uh, the communities were not reaching steady state before you were doing selection. Uh, and then right. eventually if you wait for a steady state, uh, presumably species that detoxify this particular toxin get lost or go extinct and right. so on and so forth. Um, I guess I had sort of two questions to that. One is that uh, then all of these different uh, strategies that you were trying from various pa papers, I remember the uh, Swenson PNAS paper that you were talking about had uh, pretty long periods bit between selection cycles, right? You said about a month or so. Uh, right. Uh, do you do you think that period was not was still not long enough for these communities to have stabilized, or am I missing something? I think I think it's likely that there aren't no because the environment itself is changing. The plant is growing, right? So uh, over a period of time, the plant is growing in size. So all of the rhizobacteria are going to be exchanging. The plant is recruiting, right, uh, microbes, and as the larger the plant is, the more nutrients will release, right? So the the for sure, the environment is not constant, right? This is not a chemostat, right? It's a, it's there are communities growing on a, on a, on a plant, um, but it doesn't matter how long it is. I mean, I, if you were in a situation and for equilibrium to occur, death and birth have to be equal to one another, and the environment needs to be constant, right? If the environment is not constant, right, and uh, then you can't have communities in equilibrium. But what you can have is that if you do multiple passages. You could be in a situation where the when you inoculate from the previous generation, you're going to have a succession, right? And over time, the success, the ecological succession, the ecological dynamics over a single batch will be the same uh, over one generation to the next, right? And when you are in that, in a state which you can call, um, I think we call this a generational equilibrium, which means that the succession um, or is the same. For instance, if you take uh, you know my microbial community, you put it in a in a in a, in a you know, test tube with sugar water, right? Um, then there's going to be some cells, are, some species are going to grow more than others. Then the, as they grow, they're going to change the environment. Then that's going to lead to other species growing. They will change the environment further. And, and, and over time, so you're going to have consumers and resources are going to, are going to have some dynamics, right? Um, the equilibrium we're talking about is that um, it's that the, the population dynamics you have over a single period of time should be the same uh, as you would have over the next generation right if you after after you're done with the first period of time you you, know, you take you sample cells from this population to, to see another population you're going to have another another period of time where you're going to have growth and if those two were equal right if you have population dy dynamics that were the same uh you would be in a situation where you can uh you can apply this these ideas right so that's what we mean by stability right it's not stability within a single population a single batch incubation that's almost impossible unless you're working on a chemostat. Um, it is, which is never the case in any of the experiments we've ever seen. Although I guess you could do these experiments in a chemostat, in which case the, 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 that would be another point. Uh, but if you do experiments in serial bats, as all of the experiments so far have been done, uh, you, you, need, they, you need to have a, you need to reach a state of generational equilibrium, right? Where the, the successions on each bat, batch are the same as they will be in the next. Right. I understand. Though now this makes me wonder with the fact that, uh, you know, it's hard to disentangle the timescales of ecology and evolution. Will you ever reach a generational equilibrium in reality? Uh, typically we, because oh, if, we, it, we, if it if it could take a long, uh, long time to occur because the environment is constantly being modified. And right. so on and so on. I, I have actually, when I, have, I don't have the data here with me, but we're, we're now writing a paper. We've done a, uh, an enrichment culture for a year. 
Um, and the both functionally and, and compositionally communities are the same uh, after a year as you have the year previous. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, very sure that it is possible. I mean, I'm not saying that it will be always true, right? Sure. It's true. I mean, it, like in biology, there's no, <laughs> there's no universal laws, right? I guess it depends. But um, I, it's definitely possible, right, for, for you to have be in a situation of fairly stable dynamics over very long periods of time. Um, and, and that those dynamics actually, once the, 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 the fast modes decay, um, they look about the same as, as, they, as they do, you know, hundreds of generations later. Thank you. So, I mean, I, I am, yeah, I mean, I think it's possible, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so um, now the question is, if, we, if we're trying to come up with better protocols, to, I mean, how do you generate this variation, right? And it is that you, you seed communities, the community stabilize through sub subsequent passaging. Um, and I, I'm not saying, look, I, I don't think you absolutely need to be exactly at equilibrium. Um, the, the big problem of doing selection where you're very far from equilibrium, though, is that, is that you're going to be, um, is that heritability is going to suffer, right? The closer you are to equilibrium, the more heritable traits are, right? So I don't think it's, you need to be in absolutely 100% stable state right at the center, right? Um, in fact, I don't think it's possible for a biological systems to be that way, right? Without any, there would, there's always going to be noise, there's going to be environmental fluctuations and so on and so forth, right? But what we are trying to advocate here is that you need to at least let the communities get rid of those fast modes, right? And so that the, the dynamics will equilibrate somewhat, right? And, and therefore, when you create a, an offspring from a parent, the offspring and the parent are gonna look alike, right? Because if, if not, then selection can't work, right? That, that, that's honestly the, 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 the take home message here, right? It's not that we are being extremely fundamentalists with the idea of equilibrium, right? You, you should be close to it or, or attempt to, right? Um, but I, 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 I agree that it's not possible, but uh, to be exactly at, at the fixed point ever, right? Um, now, there's various ecological mechanisms that you can generate variation once you're, once you're in equilibrium to diversify, right? Um, you could, for instance, take the community that has the highest function, and then you could mix it with all of the other communities, right? Uh, you can, this is called community coalescence. Um, you could just apply a very strong bottleneck, which is something that people have done, by the way, without even calling it RPL selection or anything like that. You could set up an enrichment community, and then you apply a series of large bottlenecks, and then keep the whatever community does best, right? That has been fun to work. Um, you could just add uh, new species to each of the habitats uh, from uh, regional species pools. Um, and, and through that process, you could add variation between habitats in their genetic composition. Um, you could knock in species. You can uh, spike in new taxa to different ones, different strains to each one of the communities. Or you could attempt to knock them down or out um, if you want. Right? Uh, you can also, of course, stimulate evolution. I'll talk more about that later. But basically, the, the, in a nutshell, this is what we're advocating for, right? Is, is you start from a, a number of communities, right? Um, you let them all equilibrate. Then you take the, the one that does best. Then you perturb it 100 different ways, right? Uh, so you now you create variation again. Uh, the communities equilibrate again. And then once they equilibrate, you can repeat, right? And what I'm comparing is a parent community um, and the offspring community in equilibrium. Right? This is a community equilibrium. And this is what I mean in equilibrium, right? Is that the function has this here I'm plotting the function over generations. Um, th there's this early phase where the function is stabilizing, and here it stabilizes again, right? Uh, and now after it's stabilized, you can compare the, a stable parent with a stable offspring, right? Um, and we, we can do it many, many times, right? A um, hundred different times with hundred different metapopulations. This is what we're doing here. And we're comparing the parent uh, function uh, and offspring function. Uh, this this um, dashed line here is the identity line, meaning that uh, you would not be doing better through this process as you would do simply selecting the best community and, and keeping it. Um, for all of these ecological perturbations that I was mentioning before, we found that they in general work, right? At least in theory. Right? So so these um, these these are mechanisms by which once you have communities in equilibrium, you can you can diversify them through purely ecological processes, even with no evolution present, right? None of this. Um, the, the, the species we have are the same, right? The, the, uptick, the, the vectors, right, uh, of uptake rates, which is what a species is in our models, they, they remain the same as they were, right? Um, but you are adding new taxa or el eliminating them and therefore creating compositional variants, which are communities that have different um, population sizes for the I mean, different abundances for the different taxa you had in, right? So all of these, all of these processes work um, 
uh, whereas the, the, the mixed pool strategy and the, other, the, the propagation methods did not. And, and, and they were all done under the same conditions as those, right? So, so it's, we are comparing apples and apples here. Alvaro. Yes. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes, of course. Uh, this is Andreas speaking. Um, yeah, so you were mentioning that you were working with some biotechnological applications. So I was just wondering, uh, in this strategy that you wait for a community to achieve a certain steady state and then to take an action, in a biotechnological application, such as, for example, wastewater treatment or something, yes. conditions are not constant. So right. this is one more complication to, to the problem, right? How Absolutely. It could be that the community just doesn't achieve a steady state or, or it does achieve a steady state and then conditions change and then the whole thing, uh, you know, right. how, how do you tackle that? That's a very good question. Um, and, and it is not obvious because it's, it's going to depend on, on, on the time scale of those changes and, uh, and, and of course the details, right? Um, we are trying to think of this as a, as a way to say, you know, um, right, so, so you, you, you have, the, when conditions change very much, right? Uh, that's gonna drive a species composition to any, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna basically mess up your ecosystem, right? Um, it'll, that'll happen no matter what, right? Because it, it'll, it'll happen even if you design your community synthetically, right? If you create a synthetic community that will work in a given environment and the environment changes, um, then that, that'll have the same effect. Um, we have found, however, and I think I actually didn't put the data here, but that when you use this process iteratively, right? Um, then the system actually becomes uh, fairly, at least in our simulations, right? This is so I'm talking about simulation data. We haven't done this yet out in the field. Um, but at least in our simulations, when you use a specific perturbation to, um, to create your community, to create variations in your communities, one of the features we have observed is that the communities actually become uh, uh, resilient to that perturbation itself, right? So for instance, if we used invasions uh, from species from the, from the environment as a way to generate variation in our, in our, in our, in our community pools, uh, we find that after we get the, the community, a, a final community where we have improved uh, the function, that community happens to be also resilient to invasions, right? Has become uh, entrained in the, in the perturbation we used to generate it. I, I do not know how um, generalizable that finding is, and, and this is something I would love to explore in the future, right? Uh, if by applying uh, multiple perturbations to these communities and particularly bringing new taxa, you can create functional redundancy that may sustain this function uh, despite the perturbations you're adding, right? Um, I think this is a, an area that is ripe for exploration. And to my knowledge, no one has looked into it, right? At least within the, 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 the framework of directed evolution. Um, it is the same problem in, in synthetic, if you design the, the, the community synthetically, right? You would need to somehow design them in such a way that, um, that they will be re resilient to changes in the environment, right? Um, and and I, by the way, environmental change is another way that you can, it's another perturbation you could use to, to control for, for these communities. But I, I would say that overall, if it, if it depends on, on the specific applications, but if the environments were changing very, very, very much, it would be very difficult, right, to engineer a community that will sustain function in all of those environments, right? Um, even if you try functional redundancy and all the typical ecological tricks, right? Um, if, if the changes in, in the environment are very, very dramatic, I, I could imagine that, that you would eventually lose the function, right? And, and I, I don't think there's an easy uh, solution to that particular problem, I think. But at least as long as those, those perturbations are not too dramatic, right? We find that uh, the method that you use to generate variation um, can help your communities acquire resistance to it, the perturbations along those lines, right? Because essentially the, the, you're training your community to, to withstand those perturbations as you form it, right? So, so that at least is encouraging, but we've done it for one perturbation and, and I cannot generalize it too, uh, too widely, right? Thanks. Yes. Um, all right, so we talked about evolution as, as a mechanism to replenish variation, right, um, in, in communities, which is another, um, another of the, the, the questions that we, um, that, that has come up during this talk. Um, and, and indeed, right, species level evolution uh, will generate variation between communities, even if there's no other ecological mechanisms um, here, right, or, or if ecology itself is very, it's a very poor 
or these ecological processes are, are not in, in, at play, right? Uh, or at least have a very weak effect uh, because you know a, a mutations are, are random. They will occur in random positions of the genome. And, and that is if you have a complex community that you have multiple potential targets that can evolve in different ways. So evolution on its own might be able to regenerate some of the variation that is lost every time you do selection. So we wanted to do an experiment where we're, we could um, create, um, address that specific question by um, creating ecologically stable uh, communities um, that were defined and, and were very large. And we know exactly what we're putting in. So in all previous experiments I've described, the, the communities were inoculated from basically random species pools from the environment, right? So we wanted to do an experiment where we would know what we were putting in, right? With the hope that that would help us, um, where you know, first evolution would be, the, uh, species evolution would be the only mechanism that variation could be introduced um, if we follow the, the propagative method, which we know is very, very poor at generating variation. So we, we set up an experiment like that, right? So we create a synthetic consortia um, that will, uh, and we were selecting for the ability of this synthetic consortium to hydrolyze um, starts. So we chose four different soil bacteria that secrete amylase to the environment. Amylase is an enzyme that breaks down starts, producing glucose as well as um, other disaccharides and, and small oligosaccharides, right? And we, we, we made consortia that were re identical replicates of one another. In fact, we let them equilibrate ecologically before we start the, ex the actual evolution experiment. Uh, so that we would have uh, copies of the exact same consortium. We made 24 of them. Um, and then, so this, the, uh, the starting point has, should have very, very little genetic variation. I mean, I guess you could have had some spontaneous mutations in those four days of uh, the initial, um, you have some strain level diversification, but should be very, very, very minimal, right? Um, and then we started 24 populations from, from that stock. Um, and what we were doing is we would, um, uh, Every, at the end of every uh, 24 hour period of growth, we would harvest the, the, the environment. So these, were, these bacteria were grown in, in, in media that contain starch as the primary carbon source. Um, and to metabolize starch, bacteria, these bacteria release enzymes that break it down into glucose, then the glucose they uptake, right? So the secretion of this amylase is required uh, for the community to function, but it's also a costly trait at the individual level, right? So what we were doing in this case is that um, we were assaying the, the amylolytic activity, the enzymatic activity of the, of the, of the community by taking the, the media that contain the enzymes and incubating it with starts, right? And then we could uh, measure the amount of, the fraction of starts that have been degraded over time. This is what I'm plotting here, the fraction of starts degraded by the enzymes released by, by one of these, uh, in this case, is Bacillus satellis, right? Uh, we took the enzymes they, they secrete, incubated with starts, and measure the, the, the amount of starts in the, in the medium as a function of time. This is the fraction of starts that has been degraded, right? Um, and this is actually um, uh, follows very closely a very simple two step uh, biochemical kinetic model that's, you know, using mechanism and kinetics for uh, action in two steps. Right? Don't worry about those details, they're not really relevant. But there's a single fitting parameter, V which is proportional to the, the concentration of enzyme you have uh, and the catalytic rate of the enzyme, right? So basically the, how fast this curve grows is proportional to the, the, the rate uh, of, of enzymatic activity, which, and that is the function we're gonna measure. This, when you see V in the next plots, that's the function we are measuring is the, how fast the enzymes they release break down starts. And we follow the propagative strategy because we know that it minimizes the, um, the ecological variation, right? So all of the, the most of the variation that we would see should come from, from evolutionary processes. And we basically select the top four communities that give us the, the highest amylolytic activity every generation. And each one of these, we used, used to seed six new communities. We sampled from it. So we grew for 24 hours. And then from that 24 hour growth, we sampled one out of every, I think it was 200 um, cells and passes them to a new environment, let them grow again and repeat um, every generation, right? So now after, after every 48 hour, 24 hour period of growth, we would assay the amount of um, starts um, activity, uh, uh, starts degradation activity, and then select the four with highest activity and we we'll repeat this process uh, for 17 generations. We would compare the uh, experiment with a random selection line where we would just Every, every generation, we would just pick four random communities and, and use them to seed through the same propagule method as we discussed before, um, six new um, 
new communities, right? So we have a, 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 a propagule strategy, which is the, the one we're, we're, we're using for selection, and then a random selection line where we just randomly select them for taxa, every, different ones every generation. Um, now, there's again, there's no migration in the system, um, and this is the propagule strategy, which we have already shown uh, that it shouldn't actually generate a lot of variation ecologically uh, speaking. So evolution is the primary mechanism that can generate variation in our communities. So, um, we plot here the mean function in our communities as a function of uh, generations for the random selection control here, this is in red, and this is artificial selection treatment in blue. Um, the, it, it's interesting because we do see, right, that evolution is generating um, sufficient variation that random selection is going to be uh, the gradient function, right? That is actually not surprising because in the absence of, um, of group level selection, the there's amylase expression is a costly trait, right? The, and and it's, a, it's a public goods uh, trait where the, the, uh, the, the enzymes secreted by a, by a given, by a, by a, by a, by a, by a cell um, produces glucose that every other cell in the community can, can eat. So if any mutants arose in the population that do not contribute to the production of the enzyme, um, they might benefit from it um, and therefore exclude those that, that produce it, right? So the fact that we see that when you do not apply group level selection, the function dec declines over time has been reported by other authors for, for extracellular enzymes. So that's actually quite makes quite a lot of sense. Uh, and what we see through the artificial selection treatment is that the function doesn't increase, right? Uh, but what you do is have is a case of an evolutionary biology, this is called purifying selection, right? So you, 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 you purge the communities with low function and get rid of them, right? Uh, and so essentially what we're doing here is that communities where cheaters arise that do not produce this, this, uh, this enzyme um, give rise to lower community level um, uh, amylolytic activity and they are not selected uh, to pass to the next generation, right? So we maintain the function um, over time. It doesn't improve, uh, but at least it doesn't, it doesn't decline. Now, if you compare these two lines, you, you will see that the experiment has been successful, right? In that the, the average uh, the average amount of uh, activity here is better than here, uh, but it really, as other experiments have seen too, it, we did, didn't really see an improvement, right? It, we are seeing um, about the same activity up to 16 transfers as we had originally, even if by doing artificial selection, we did better than the control. Now, this tells us two things. One is that evolution can, in principle, um, work out to produce this variation, right, that, that for selection to act on. Though in this particular experiment, the, it didn't help us, um, it, it, but it at least prevented um, the degradation of the, the collective function. Right? So this is another way in which uh, evolution can act in these communities. So um, the question then is, is, okay, so evolution can, can work, but what might be working, um, what, what might be uh, not, not working right, in, our, in, our, in our communities? So one of the, the, the points that we wanted to uh, emphasize is that when you're exploring fitness landscapes, uh, evolvability is important, right? So if, you, if you're doing artificial uh, directed evolution at the molecular level, uh, it is required that the fitness landscape must be navigable, right? That, that, it, that evolvability has to be high because if it isn't, uh, then artificial selection or directed evolution is, is very unlikely to work. Um, the, the, how smooth the fitness landscape is, is very, very important. So by analogy, if we are exploring um, uh, what we call this structure function landscape, which is the connection between community composition and function, um, it, it, is, it is very important to understand what are the, uh, how, um, what are the, 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 the properties of that landscape? Uh, is, it, is it smooth, is it, is it rugged? And, 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 and why does it matter? Now it's kind of easy to see why this matters because if you have, if you plot, for instance, the function, this is just a cartoon, right? So if you plot the function of a stable parental community, um, and, which is, I mean, in equilibrium or near, and again, it's the function of, um, st of, of stable offspring variants. So basically you have a parental community that has high function, you make multiple offspring variants and this, each one of them has a function that is similar to the parent, right? Um, if you have a situation like this, um, then uh, what this means is that communities with high function are, uh, are in a state of equilibrium that is surrounded by other, other equilibrium states that are, ha also have high function, right? Whereas uh, communities that have low function, um, that are in a state of low function, 
uh, will be surrounded by other stable states that are also low function. And if you have a situation of this kind, then uh, artificial selection is likely to work, right? Because you, you, you can climb, this is equivalent to having a smooth landscape, right? Where there's, uh, the, the function is correlated between neighbors. But if on the other hand, you have a situation like this, right? Where the function of the stable, um, basically an, an equilibrium in the parental a community that's an equilibrium in a parental community was surrounded by other equilibria that have functions very different from the one in the parental state and which, um, and, and where the, 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 the fact that, that basically when equilibria were not necessarily surrounded by other equilibria with high function, with similar functions, but, but random, uh, then it really is no better selecting for a community with high function than it would be selecting for any random community and, and just uh, randomly choosing uh, others, right? So it, it, is, it is equally important that that this, the structured function landscapes need to have some structure to them, right? And, and they, need, they should be smooth in some sense, right? Uh, and I know it's kind of weird to think of this because these are, this are you know, uh, we are mapping community composition to function, not a genotype to a phenotype, but the, the, the algorithmic process should be, the, should be the same, right? You should have uh, correlations in, in, in your fitness landscape. And if, it's, if, if fitness is very uncorrelated with, with structure, uh, you're going to have a very ragged fitness landscape that is very going to be very difficult to explore, right? So directed evolution is not going to work if that were the case. So um, probability should be important here too. And, uh, and, and we need to know what shape then a, a structure function landscapes have, right? And, and, and find out how navigable they should be. So um, we have done um, this. We have actually tried to map this fitness landscapes a couple of times. Um, we worked with Morten Sommer's lab on, on trying to design, uh, map it for communities that are involved in uh, sugar cane, that are used in sugar cane refineries in Brazil, as well as with uh, amylolytic communities um, that are the same as I discussed before. So I'm going to focus on this experiment, uh, but you could read the paper if you want to know what we did on this front. Um, just as we did before, I what I wanted to do here was to explore how, how what are the, the, the properties of a structured function landscape for communities um, and, and how amenable they're going to be for artificial selection, how navigable they're going to be, right? So we, we went to the exact same model system as we used in the artificial selection experiment. Um, and we added two additional, uh, two additional strains uh, to have uh, higher dimensionality. But I mean, the experiment is the same. We grow, grew each one of these separately in a different test tube. We harvested the enzymes they release over that period of 48 hours. And then we measure the, the degradation of starts and and then we fit it to the model that we have here to extract the function of its community, which is how fast they degrade starts, right? And um, at that point, what we can do then is, is using basic biochemical kinetics, we know that when you mix two enzymes uh, that act independently on a substrate, then the rates of the pair of enzymes is going to be the sum of the rates of both enzymes, right? So if you, if you culture separately each member of this consortia, and then you take the enzymes from A and the enzyme from B and mix it together with starts, and you track the degradation of starts by this, this, um, this com, uh, cocktail of enzymes, what you will predict is that uh, the, the, the fraction of starts degraded over time should scale as, as predicted by this um, the gray line, right? That's, that's the expectation. And now the actual experimental data is these red points and the fit is this data here, right? So what you can see in this case um, is, is a situation where they're actually um, quite, uh, quite uh, additive, right? This, by the way, this is not people in Excel, that's a mistake. Right? Um, we actually did it for our, our collection of isolates and, 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 and we, we showed that when you just mix the enzymes together, right? The, 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 the kinetic rate of degradation by the cocktail of enzymes is actually very, very well predicted by the sum of the degradations from each, right? The degradation rate from each. So this, this is a really an additive and a function that is naturally additive as predicted from biochemical kinetics. But you could have various kinds of interactions that could cause deviations from that null model, right? You could have, for instance, that when you actually co-culture um, two species together, um, that you, you could find that you, you have that when they grow together, uh, one, of the, one of the species uh, stimulates um, or inhibits the growth of another. So you have species A on its own grows uh, a lot and secretes a lot of enzyme, but in co-culture with species B, it will grow a lot less. And as it grows less, it will produce less enzyme. And likewise, uh, you are gonna have um, other types of interactions that are gonna be completely behavioral, which is 
uh, one species going alone is going to be secreting some amount of enzyme, but in co-culture with the other species, it might secrete less, right? So there's various ways in which when you are co-culture two species together, the amount of enzyme they produce is going to be less, right? And those interactions are, should be leading to more ragged uh, structure function landscapes, right? Whereas if species are growing separately um, and, and then you combine the, the if, if, if when you grow them together, they didn't have any of these interactions, uh, we know that the, they should be uh, obeying the null model we have, which is that their, their activity is going to be additive. Uh, and, and that will predict that you're gonna have a very navigable uh, structure function landscape. The, quite surprisingly, uh, actually, we found that uh, for all communities, when one of these members was not present, this member is called people in Ixa, um, they actually give rise to a very additive and easy to navigate landscape. So uh, in other words, if you co-culture pairs, trios, four member communities and five member communities that do not include this bacterium here, people in Ixa, and you, you, you just, uh, as you, you compare the growth rate, the, I'm sorry, the, the amylolytic activity of those consortia with the amylolytic activity of simply taking each of the bacteria growing separately in separate test tubes and combining the enzymes after they have grown, you get the same result, right? So um, it's as if they were not interacting in any way, right? So you get a very, very additive and easy to navigate landscape. When people in as part of the consortia, however, the, the, you, you do see perhaps what we would have expected. This is like a, a much more ragged and, and, uh, and um, uh, landscape where you see deviations from the prediction of the additive model, right? So we, we see the equivalent of epistasis, right? At the functional level. And uh, that is despite the fact that when we actually looked into whether there were actual ecological interactions, we found that there were. The actually these bacteria were competing with one another and affecting each other's, um, each other's growth, right? Uh, B. cereus and B. megatherium, which is one of these two points over here, um, do uh, grow differently in co-culture than they do um, separately. The reason why, why this works, however, why, why once one can have a, an additive fitness landscape when poly polymyxia is not present, um, despite the fact that we have uh, uh, interactions here, is that, that the interactions saturate, right? The amount of enzymatic activity, uh, the amount of enzyme released by a species um, becomes independent of, of final population size uh, after some threshold, right? So what that means is that any kind of interactions that if you plot enzymatic activity as a function of population size for any one of these bacteria, um, and it, it looks something like this. So if you have a species growing in monoculture at this population size and this amount of enzyme, and in co-culture with another, it might actually come down in population size, right? But the function, the amount of enzyme it produces will not change. And that uh, partly explains why, despite the fact that we do have population dynamics interactions, the, the function of the collective can be predicted from an additive model. Um, by contrast, when you have polymyxia growing in our communities, uh, people in grows very poorly. Uh, so it starts below this threshold and it is facilitated by the others. And that's why uh, you see that um, you have both a behavioral interaction and population dynamics interaction, which explains why this um, is so rugged. And we can characterize this all in terms of uh, pairwise and higher order interactions uh, that can be measured. And they're very, very small for in the absence of polymyxa, but very large when polymyxa is present. Um, and I, that's all I wanted to say, right? I, um, what we are, are finding in, in, in some is that directed evolution might allow us to engineer biological systems. Um, I would completely agree with some of the questions I got. I think this is a lot easier when uh, we are talking about industrial processes, at least when the environment could be controlled so that we can eliminate fluctuations. Uh, but I, we also are finding that, that uh, there, there is a lot of potential for our understanding of how engineering communities through perturbations might actually create communities that are resistant to those perturbations, right? And, and that's an area um, of, of future work that um, I think we're quite excited about. Um, we are identifying rules that uh, should, be, uh, should greatly improve, at least in theory, we, need, we are now testing this experimentally, um, the power of direct evolution to engineer community functions. Um, and finally, we are, we are seeing that the, the, that, that the properties of this structure function landscape uh, are very important for our ability of direct evolution to work just as they are for molecular level evolution to work. And I think um, and one of the areas that I think I find very appealing of all this, this research is that um, 
fitness landscape theory has benefited a lot from directed evolution. I think directed evolution has, has allowed us to get a much deeper understanding of, of the relationship between genotype and phenotype at the molecular scale. And I think that, that understanding applying directed evolution at the microbial community level will be very helpful to help us understand uh, the, the relationship between structure and function in communities, right? So I, I think that that's uh, an, a, 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 an area with a lot of potential for, for growth in the future. Um, finishing up by thanking everyone in the lab who has been doing um, all of the all of the work that I told you about today. And uh, I don't know if we have time for more questions. I suspect we don't, but uh, if I'm happy to stay a bit longer if anyone wants to ask anything else.